Good afternoon. My name is Tom Graham, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Macmillan at the Macmillan Center. Used to be here at the Jackson Institute, but this is a wonderful uh, environment. And I want to welcome you to our uh, next session in a speaker series on Russian politics. One of the big questions we always ask is, where is Russia headed? And what we're particularly interested in finding out is what happens post-Putin, uh, and perhaps even more than that, when will we finally get to post-Putin? Uh, and we have a wonderful speaker here uh, to help us think through the uh, Russian politics today, particularly take a look at this from the people who are in the opposition uh, uh, to Putin, in the real opposition, not the opposition that is in the Communist Party or the Liberal Democrats, uh, what we tend to call either in Russian or in, uh, in the West, the ASIM systemic opposition. Uh, and we couldn't ask for a better person to address this issue for us. Uh, Leonid Volkov is a world fellow uh, at Yale. He is a leader of Russia's future party. Uh, he has been deeply engaged in Russian opposition politics for many years, uh, associated most clearly with Alexei Navalny, also a former world fellow here at Yale, 2010, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, and helped run his campaign for mayor of Moscow, and, and most important, uh, his campaign for president of Russia uh, in, in 2018. He's also had experience at the local level, having served in the city Duma uh, in Ekaterinburg uh, several years back. And added to all of this, he's also an IT professional. Uh, so he understands modern communications. Uh, he's written a, uh, a book on cloud democracy, uh, which is going to uh, help us uh, think how you redefine, reshape democracy uh, and elections uh, in this modern communications era. Uh, he has his own uh, company's Internet Protection, Com Internet Protection Society, Protection yeah. Society yeah. that is looking at the digital aspects of, uh, of politics in the 21st century. Uh, so the way we're going to run this session today uh, is Leonid is going to give us about 40, 45 minutes up front, his view uh, of Russia. Uh, then we welcome all of you uh, to participate in what I think will be a very lively uh, question and answer period. So Leonid, it's all over to you. Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, yes, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks a lot to the Yellow Fellows for my term here and for the Jackson Institute and for the Milan Center and the Russian uh, Eastern European Studies program. I'm enjoying my time here, and I feel like everyone is trying to contribute to, to, to make this time even more great. Well, uh, I'm happy that so many people have come to any event in Russia these days. So, so, of course, I would be more happy if for some other reason. So there is now so much interest in Russia everywhere I go and this all different people I meet, but unfortunately this is more of an interest like well not about when we'll have next also Dostoevsky, more like <laughs> when they'll get rid of Putin finally. Uh sorry. Now, now it's even better. Sorry. Uh, actually, the part I like most of this kind of talks are questions and answers, to see what's interesting for the audience and, and to go where it goes. But I can't switch immediately to that because I see people of very different ages, backgrounds, academic, non-academic, so on. So I probably have to spend like several, some, some time to, to, to put everyone on the same page. Uh, and then to, I'll try to give my perception of what's going on in Russia currently and what's our strategy, I mean, our the opposition's strategy uh, regarding this moment. And then uh, finally we'll go to questions and answers. So once again, I am uh, chief of staff for Alexei Navalny. And the, that guy who is always making use by being detained and arrested and released and arrested again. But apart from this, he is running 
a largest NGO uh, in Russia called the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which is active since eight years and does all those famous anti-corruption uh, investigations. Bring corruption to the agenda, and that's very important because corruption is how Russia is run, organized, and governed now these days. Uh, uh, Alexei Navalny's anti-corruption investigation investigations uh, made him the leader of the Russian opposition. He verified this status participating in the Moscow mayoral election of 2013 when he finished surprisingly in the second place with almost 30% of uh, popular vote and nearly forcing a runoff with the incumbent mayor Sergei Sabanin. After that, uh, he was never anymore admitted to the ballot in any election, <laughs> probably because, well, Putin considered it too dangerous. It doesn't matter. Still, uh, he is building a large political organization which is able now to impose even more pressure on the Kremlin, on the regime, and doing it in very various ways through YouTube videos, through uh, street rallies, through participation or boycott campaign, but boycott campaigns of the elections, and in many other ways, uh, proving itself to be the only independent uh, source of political activity in the whole country. They're only independent from, from Kremlin, and that's why it's so important. Uh, I'm a proud m member of this movement, which you could call Navalny team, or Anti-Corruption Foundation, or the Russia Future Party, it doesn't matter. So when we have to participate in an election, we, we, we are the Russia's Future Party. When, uh, when we support Alexei uh, in some anti-corruption uh, campaign, we, we, we say it's a project of an anti-corruption foundation, it's not that important. It's just, a, well, the Navalny movement, the opposition movement to Russia. I'm a proud member of it since well, 2011, working closely with Alexei as his chief of staff and occasionally also as his campaign manager. Uh, my education and background is in mathematics and computer science. So quite surprisingly for a political manager, but that's because, that's mostly because we actually have to use internet technology and all all kinds of new technology in our political operations because we have no other way and no other choice. So since at least 10 years, we are cut off any mainstream media, uh, no access to television, newspapers, radio networks, whatever. Uh, and internet, uh, in the last couple of years, mostly YouTube, remains the most important uh, media most important means of communication with the Russian voters, with our supporters. So a lot of technology is involved in our political operation. Uh, in December 2016, Alexei Navalny announced he would run in the upcoming presidential election, which took place in March 2018. Uh, he spent a year building a network of regional campaign offices, regional campaign head headquarters. We finally had 87 of them in 65 of Russia's 85 regions. So really all over the country, all over its 11 time zones. These local election uh, campaign offices organized the activities of several hundreds, thousands of volunteers and supporters doing like door to door campaign, some, some, some call it a very American style political campaign, distributing some campaign literature, uh, spreading the word online, offline by any means. And the aim of this, well, political operations, the aim of this movement was to get Alexei registered on the ballot. That was a technical task. We had to collect 300,000 signatures to get him registered. And also the political task because, I mean, the decision if Alexei would or would not be admitted uh, to run in the presidential election was, of course, primarily a political decision. He was not admitted. We started a boycott campaign uh, declaring the, this 
March 2018 election a completely fake election, which it was, in fact. Uh, and the most important thing we did, and we are continue, uh, continuing doing, as we kept this network uh, that we built during 2017 alive. So, of course, we had to scale down a little bit because we rely completely on crowdfunding and on micro donations. There is no other uh, source of funding of our political operations, but what our supporters uh, donate to us. So, of course, after the campaign, the, the presidential campaign uh, came to the end, we had to scale it down. Still, we kept 45 of the regional uh, offices, so we have the presence, the political presence in any Russian city with a population over 500,000 and in some smaller cities as well, which is very important because those 45 regional offices remain the points of crystallization of any kind of political activity. Would it be some ecological protest or anti-corruption investigation or they participate in the nationwide uh, anti-retirement age reform rallies or whatever, but these 45 regional uh, offices is, is a new asset that we have built, that we have uh, created from, from scratch during all the 2017 campaign. Uh, our regional offices run uh, under enormous pressure. It's very common for a regional coordinator to get detained, arrested, some occasionally beaten up, uh, to face different problems, his or her relatives being fired from their jobs, all kinds of administrative pressure is applied. Still, it's up and running. It's very important that we keep this network in place and my daily operation still, even while here at Yale, uh, includes coordinating the efforts of these regional offices of this network. Uh, managing the projects, the local projects they run and also uh, involving them in uh, Russia-wide uh, scale projects. So that's where we stand. That's how our movement looks like now, in very brief terms, of course. And that's the movement, movement I represent here. Why we are doing that? Why we are not waiting for the next election cycle? Why we are keeping um, this network uh, despite all the pressure uh, Kremlin puts against it. Why we are, well, putting our people under risk, one could uh, ask. Uh, <clears throat> Why don't we spend the donations in some other way, on some other political operation, not on the regional network, maybe? The answer is uh, that we believe this pressure uh, they create daily, weekly, monthly, is itself very important. It's now a very important factor of Russian politics. And here I want to describe where, in my opinion, well, Russian politics stands now, what's the critical conflict within the Russian politics. What's, what's happening? Why, at the end of the day, why the Putin's approval rating is going down dramatically, uh, 20 or 30 points, even more, even according to the state-sponsored and state-owned uh, polling agencies. This is something which never happened before, but now in the last six months, he went down from, well, 75 to maybe 45 points. Being under 50 is actually something, something he never experienced before. So what's going on? Why? And why is it so important to <coughs> Uh, keep and develop our regional organization, our regional political organization under such circumstances. The model I keep in mind is the following. So Russia now is a very typical mafia state. So it's unfortunately, I hate to say that, but it's nothing special. Uh, this planet has seen similar regimes 
everywhere, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, even in Europe. It's just a mafia state and, well, we have the Godfather and he has his lieutenants and thus those lieutenants are immersed in a permanent conflict. So imagine one top member of a Russian political elite, maybe a governor of some large and rich and some, some region, uh, rich natural resources. And imagine a, another member of top Russian political elite who would be like really Putin's right hand, uh, right hand lieutenant, like Igor Sechin, uh, who is in charge of all oil exports. Or imagine someone who is in charge of gas exports, aluminum exports, of drug imports, or whatever, what they do in their mafia usually. They always are in conflict. So consider a oil field in that rich region. Who would take the, the rent uh, from this oil field? Who would be the first on stealing the, 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 the proceeds? The regional governor or the head of the state oil company? They both want to participate and this create a conflict. And the only tools to resolve this conflict, the only mechanism of arbitrage, is for them both to appear in Kremlin, in Putin's office, on, on the carpet, pretty much like this. And, well, to argue in front of him and to take his decision as final and <clears throat> granted. And that's the only way. There are no other uh, instruments, no other tools of, of resolving the conflicts, of arbitrage. It's all very personal. It's very important how long the waiting line outside Putin's office is and who takes which place in this, in that, in that lane. So how often could Sechin or Rottenberg or Kadyrov access Putin personally? How many minutes or hours of putting personal time this or that lieutenant have. That, that defines a lot. It's a very personalistic, very personalist regime, very authoritarian and based of course on, on, on corruption. So Russia is still a very rich country, uh, the oil prices are high once again and they are all dividing this, this pie, uh, dividing these assets somehow. Another important thing about Russia in 2018 is that no institution has any own legitimacy. So the trust, the support uh, of the, uh, the popular support for the parliament or for the regional authorities or for the church, the army, uh, the government, as for the institutions, is very low. It's somewhere around like 10 or 15 points for, for any of those institutions. People generally think that any government officials, any member of parliaments, any governors and ministers are thugs and thieves. And they're right, of course, they, they indeed are. Uh, the only exclusion being Putin himself. So before March 2018, he was definitely by a very wide margin, the most popular, the most supported politician uh, in the country. And that's why, that's uh, what ever, all the system relied on. Uh, the governor or the minister doesn't have his or her own legitimacy. All the legitimacy is inherited from, from Putin. We have to, as the citizens of this region, we have to obey to obey to our governor, not because we elected him, we didn't, we didn't, not because we trust him, we don't, but because he is appointed by Putin, and Putin is good as, as a Tsar, we trust him and we trust his decisions and his appointments and so on. And that's how it operated very successfully in the last 15 years. And Putin was very successful in uh, building the balance of power 
between all his lieutenants, making all these judgments, like you get the 30% of that deal, you get the 70% of that deal, and all stayed in that room on that carpet, and that was enough. Looks like it's not anymore enough. The system is losing this uh, stability. Why it's happening, I think, well, my answer, uh, we could argue, I'm not sure this is actually the correct answer, but that's where, where I am now. My answer is that before 2018, before the re-election, it was the optimal collective strategy for the system to work, to function that way, to increase Putin's personal approval rating and legitimacy. It was their collective strategy. So uh, maybe this governor or this uh, uh, head of oil company would not be happy with this very particular decision, dividing uh, the proceeds and the assets in this, in this ratio. But as a whole, as a, as a political allied, they still would be happy because, well, at the end of the day, every one of them would get the piece of the global pie, and the pie was huge. I mean, really huge. They, only by official statistics, they export $50 billion yearly, like in assets outside the country, and the oil and gas proceeds uh, were over $3 trillion uh, in the last 15 years. And only a very small part of this landed on the level of, of, of population. The, the largest part of this pie exists now in form of yachts, private jets, palaces, and some other luxury items. So it was important for the system, for any member of the elite, to invest in Putin's rating, in Putin's approval. Like, if something bad was happening, you'd never see Mr. President personally at the place of a fire or a flute or a plane crash. But we would see him at, in, at, at Winter Olympics, at inaugurating a new, I don't know, bridge or stadium or something like this. They all would keep this idea that everyone in the government, everyone uh, in power is bad, but Mr. President, the Tsar is good, the Boyars are bad. This is very old Russian idea, and suddenly it was working good enough in, in the 21st century as well. Now, after the re-election, the elite, at least that's how I feel it, is now starting to change this balance, this collective strategy. Because it doesn't fit anymore. The average age of the well, member of political elite is not changing. Like the average age of the governor of a, or, or a member of government uh, is well, about 45, 50 years. And it was the same 15 and 20 years ago they start to think about the post-Putin Russia, about the exit strategy, about how to keep their assets, their position, uh, their power after Putin. And of course, this very successful re-election of Putin in, on, uh, in March 2018 only ignited all those way of thinking, all, all those controversies. Because uh, now the next re-election would be, well, in 2024 only, Putin will be, well, 72 years old, which, which is a lot. He already didn't once run for the third term. So in 28, he decided not to run himself, obeying to this only part of the Constitution. Uh, at least the succession issue is on the table once again. So it, it wasn't all six years between 2012 and 2018, it wasn't. It was absolutely clear for everyone in the political elite 
that, well, what will happen in 2018? Everybody knew that. Now it's not that clear anymore. And they, they realize slowly, but they realize they have to, to invent some new strategy. So, I mean, uh, 15 years ago, a typical elite member could think that, well, Putin will be literally forever. They will, well, reach their, I don't know, biological and pretty much, well, at the same pace, at the same time. Now it's not anymore true, and if I'm a governor, like 45 years old, I have to think ab about my post-Putin existence. So I will have to start investing in my own approval rating. I have to start investing in developing some other mechanisms, some other tools for, for other arbitrage, which would create not um, oral agreements, but something more solid, some uh, rights, some uh, uh, asset rights, which would not disappear when Putin goes away. I can't prove it's what, what, what's happening right now, but I see a lot of small examples that the processes are now going that way in, in Russia. Uh, the first one, I, I'll give three of them. Uh, very briefly, but those who follow Russian politics will probably understand me why these examples are so important. The first one is the Sechino Lukaev case. So the public conflict between the uh, head of the state-owned state oil company and uh, the government member uh, secretary of uh, economics. This conflict resulted in uh, Mr. Ulukaev being uh, uh, indicted for 10, 8, I don't know, 10 years in prison for uh, alleged bribe, for, for an attempt to, to uh, get a bribe for, from Mr. Session. Something which couldn't happen in Putin's Russia 10 or even 5 years ago. A conflict which would not, which none of its parties would try to resolve in the public court, damaging the general image of the power. Like, wow, a very, very top member of the government is trying to bribe another very, very top, top member of the government. It, of course, doesn't contribute a lot to the, well, to the authority and approval of the power itself. For some reason, they did choose the other way of resolution of their conflicts, not relying on Putin's arbitrage anymore, but, well, relying on the public court system. The second, of course, the second example is uh, what, happens, what happened with the Skripal case. It's uh, with the poisoning in, in the Britain. Putin went to television himself and himself, he said all those stupid things that everyone was making jokes and still is making jokes of like, those were just tourists, we found those people, they are not poisoners, they are not GRU uh, agents, they, they were just occasionally visiting Salisbury and enjoying the famous spear of the Salisbury Cathedral. <laughs> yeah, still funny. But what made him make fun of himself? This never happened before. You can compare this with the uh, uh, with the Boeing MH17 case just four years ago. Putin never said like any stupids, any stupid things. He never said any provable lies on MH17. He just said, well, let's wait, it's all unclear. He had all the propaganda machine to, to blame this on Ukraine, to uh, develop all kinds of conspiracy theories, but he never expressed himself in the ways that everyone could just make, make fun of him. The same happened to the retirement age reform, which, which is the most important uh, thing happening in the internal politics now. Uh, the reform is very unpopular, but it's not the first very unpopular reform in Russian modern history. 12 years ago, we had the so-called monetization reform, which was 
also very unpopular and actually really made the life of millions of uh, Russians worse. And it's very interesting to, to compare Putin's behavior now and 12 years ago, because 12 years ago, he just didn't say anything public on that unpopular reform. Why, why, why should he? He had the government. Government would, would take the blow and he would always like, blame everything on the government. They are responsible for economy. They are doing probably some good things and some bad things. That thing is probably not so good. But he was never held personally responsible for that. Quite reversely, in the retirement age reform, he spoke up. He even recorded a special uh, uh, well, video on, on television. He took all the responsibility himself, which actually resulted in a dramatic uh, drop in his approval rating. Why should he? Looks like the system is not anymore that interested in pumping, in, in increasing Putin's personal approval rating. The system is looking for another ways to prove its legitimacy, uh, to another, for another ways to build its operations. That's the historical and very dramatic change happening in Russia now. So the political elite starts to consider Putin to be a lame duck. The political elite does not anymore follow the strategy of increasing his personal legit legitimacy and approval rating by all means. And the political elite is trying to find another way to resolve its conflicts to, well, to, to survive or to, to persist, to keep its assets and all those yachts and palaces and so on. So what, what should be the strategy of, of Russian opposition under these circumstances? Uh, the truth is that there is still not that much we could do. Well, we have to admit, we have to admit that there is still quite a high probability that the system will be able to survive until Putin's death. That's definitely his personal strategy. He wants to stay in Kremlin uh, before he dies. He doesn't want to resolve the succession issue. Uh, he doesn't have anyone he could really rely on uh, around him. And we've seen a lot of examples in, uh, in this world, in uh, post-Soviet countries, when even those guys who looked like very uh, reliable for uh, the leaders, for authoritarian leaders who appointed them, uh, didn't want to follow their way. Uh, something what happened in Turkmenistan, something what now is happening in Uzbekistan, many other countries as well. He just wants to stay there till he dies. And frankly, we have to face it. With the oil price as high as $85 per barrel, uh, <clears throat> and if nothing like really very dramatic happens, like when it's no new nuclear war, which is still probable, uh, Putin will be able to stay there like for another 20 years. That's a probable scenario. Unfortunate, very dramatic for Russia, very bad for Russia, but, but, but probable. The, if he managed to stabilize his elites, uh, his elites, he will be doing well. The second scenario, if some, uh, some like black swan type event, like something really dramatic happens, People go out on the streets, he gets just ousted, and some dramatic change happens. It's also probably we've seen it like the Arab Spring started in uh, Tunisia in 2011 by some kind of random event, which ignited the crowds and led to a revolution, to, well, to, to the most dramatic revolution in, in the 21st century. And the third scenario that we have to consider is the internal struggle. That the consensus of the political elite is not anymore that they need Putin as a supreme arbiter, supreme referee for their conflicts, and they start to reinvent this, this system uh, and, well, 
the system collapses or not. We don't know. All of the, uh, the good news is that, in my opinion, whatever of three scenarios happens, uh, there is not much chance for those now in power in Russia to stay in power. Uh, as everything is now built on very personal relations, on very personal ties, on very personal agreements between Putin and this, 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 and that of his lieutenants, it's not really inheritable. Uh, after he is gone, no matter what of three scenarios, they'll really start to fight with, with each other, trying to achieve a new balance. And this will be exactly the time when we'll just have to go out on the streets and demand for a new system, for the regime change, for fair election, and our chances will be good because no, none of his lieutenants, none of <coughs> uh, the current small leaders will be able to regain even like 10% of the power Putin has now. What we don't know is, we don't know which of these three scenarios will actually happen. And we also have to admit that we have no tools to influence the probability of the first and the second scenario. We can't call a black swan. We can't make the old guy die. Uh, <laughs> but we, have, we can increase the, prob the probability of the third scenario. We can increase the probability of the internal struggle. Uh, by increasing the costs, by affecting the cost-benefit ratio, by making it uh, more and more expensive in the long-term perspective for the political elite to keep the system as it is. To do this, we just need to impose more and more pressure as much as we can. Uh, And that's good news, because that's what we are doing. Our basic strategy actually, I mean, remains the same during all eight years, uh, seven years. I work closely with Alexei Navalny uh, being part of his movement, is to work hard to grow as a political organization, to invest everything in the growth and to use any, anything what happens in the country as a tool to create stress, to create more pressure on the government, on the regime, on Kremlin, and so on. So before the Moscow mayoral campaign, we had maybe eight or 10 staff and had very little experience of organizing political campaigns. After the Moscow mayoral campaign, we had 30 people uh, after the presidential campaign, we now have 45 regional offices and over 100 people. Our support base has grown from several dozen thousands of subscribers five years ago to several millions now on Alexei's uh, YouTube channel, on our mailing list, and so on, so on. This uh, two parts of the strategy are actually uh, very coherent. When you do something, when you try to do new projects, when you launch new projects, when you address the issues uh, that happen in the country, when you organize rallies against the retirement age reform, or when you try to participate uh, in any kind of elections, or do something on the regional level, it increases the amount of supporters. People see that you, well, that you are active, that you are fighting uh, against the regime, and people join you. And when people join you, when your support base grows, it increases your ability to impose pressure on the Kremlin. So the honest answer is that we have to be patient and keep going, keep doing what we are doing. We don't know 
where the regime change happens. Uh, we don't know when the regime change happens. We know that we can do a lot to increase the probability that it happens sooner than later. And we have to be the best prepared, we have to be the largest and best organized political power in the country when it happens. That's our strategy. That's actually very simple, no rocket science, but so far it looks like it works. So now the internal turbulence, the struggle within the political elite is as high as it never been, well, in the last 15 years, and hopefully we will not have to wait too long. I hope so. Thank you. Yeah, great. 40 minutes. So we have 40, 40, we have 40 more 40, minutes you, for today. You want to sit down or you want to stand up? <laughs> Thank you very much, Lainey, for that um, wonderful, comprehensive overview. Uh, I want to ask you one question, and then we'll turn to everyone else. But I know there'll be a lot of questions. Could you give us a sense of the demographics of your movement? Who are your supporters? Uh, you know, those you know, 100 people are working actively for you, but broader than that, sort of the target uh, audience within Russia, uh, the people who are going to go out in the streets are going to provide uh, the type of visual evidence of your political <coughs> strength. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's a very important question, also because it's uh, an important talking point of the propaganda that like Navalny movement is just for high school teenagers. Uh, this is not true. We do actually a lot of research and polling uh, on our own supporters base. We just today launched another questionnaire uh, asking our supporters to, uh, to, to fill some form to reply about their demographic sound. The average age of uh, a supporter registered in our database is, if I'm not mistaken, 24 years. Uh, they're young, but not too young. Uh, the visible part of our supporters. Those volunteers very actively involved in like in door-to-door -door style uh, events and so on uh, is indeed very young. Well, it's, I think it's true for every country. It's uh, easier for a person to get involved in uh, like door-to-door uh, -door political activity when the person doesn't yet have like three kids and a mortgage. So high school students or uh, undergraduate students are of course very important for this type of events. Mm, but that's not the correct mm, image of our whole support base. Uh, what is very important is that those volunteers uh, active in the streets are our only media. So that's where I started. We don't have an access to television, radio, so on. So the volunteers are our media. Uh, we had measured this during the Moscow 2013 election. Uh, I refer to this experience because it was the last election we actually participated. And that uh, despite the fact that the, most of the volunteers were like very young, the largest amount of votes uh, Alexei as a mayor, uh, as a candidate to mayor has got among like women 50 plus, hmm. probably among their mothers, something like this, because those young volunteers were our media to build outreach to other audiences that are not that active online, that we can't reach through our like YouTube channel and, and so on and so on. So, uh, mm, so the question of uh, demographics of our support base is a very important. It's very interesting for us as well, but it's, it's very diverse. Another fun fact, and very important, it's what we discovered during the old 2017 campaign, that the uh, presumption that all the political activity is concentrated in Moscow, St. Petersburg, while maybe Novosibirsk and Ekaterinburg isn't any more true. The largest rallies, so when, when Navalny came right. to a city, we did around 30 rallies, uh, sort of like public events, uh, with, his, um, with him speaking from, from the podium uh, in front of a huge crowd, the largest two events of that style in terms of percentage of uh, population of the city attending were Murmansk and Smolensk. Hmm. So two cities you'd never think of like 
protest cities or centers of political protest in Russia. Mm -hmm. Still, this was the largest. I'm going to abuse my prerogative and ask you one more question. Sure. Um, assume what happens, uh, what you want to happen happens, and Putin's gone. Um, Navalny uh, is now leader of the country. What are the first three steps he takes? Oh, it's a very good question because it's very easy to answer. We had exactly this on the presidential program when we published it. The release of political prisoners, the court reform, because it's, it's essential. You can't have free press, fair elections, nothing uh, without independent courts. And now, I mean, you can't uh, debate an election, you can't debate like anything in, in, in court because the judicial branch is not functioning as an independent branch. So it was the second, so political prisoners, court reform, and fighting the corruption, uh, which is a very, uh, which is a number of very concrete steps we have to take. Um, uh, like, uh, well, I don't want to go very much into detail, but because we started as an anti-corruption movement, we really had like very detailed um, law proposals on what we have to change in Russia to, to start fighting the corruption. I mean, bad news are good news. The corruption is so deeply rooted in the uh, Russian uh, uh, society and, and system that uh, there are so many low-hanging fruits. You really could like, now apply 20% of efforts to, uh, to, to, to kill 80% of the problems because they're too obvious. Okay, but you're gonna start with rule of law. Rule of law, exactly. So Okay, so questions. If you uh, raise your hand, I'll uh, please identify. Well, wait for the mic. Ah, because we're recording, right? Right, right. We have uh, so, identify yourself and ask the question. So uh, the, the young lady right here. Yeah. So uh, who's helping with the mic? Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> being with us. Um, my question is, other than the communal pressure, uh, what other factors are contributing to uh, the political elite moving away from working for um, um, expanding or increasing uh, Putin's support base, but rather turning uh, to themselves? Uh, so sorry, I have to ask you to ask this question once again. So what is... Uh, what, what prevents the political elite from expanding their own support base? No, like, um, other than the communal pressure, what makes the political elite um, turn away from um, working from uh, Putin's political base, uh, for, from, like, Putin, but rather than invest in themselves? Why did, why are the, so basically, why are the political elite the now turning away, uh, turning their backs to Putin, but not, what, why didn't they do it before, but what changed now? Uh, yeah, so, once again, uh, firstly, because now the, suc the succession question is once again on the plate. So no one had a doubt that uh, uh, what, what is the scenario for 2018 election. Now it's a lot of uncertainty, uh, uncertainty about 2024. I mean, it's even not clear if Putin will actually try to run or to uh, change the constitution and transform Russia into like invent some other position for himself or try to play the Medvedev scenario once again. It's all very unclear. And also this, what I tried to explain, this age difference is growing between, and between Putin and the average elite member and it makes the average elite member to think about the, the post-Putin future. Thank you. Right down here in the down here in the front. Hi, my name is Olena. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your uh, brave presentation. Um, I'm from Ukraine, um, and kind of related to that question, uh, to what extent do you think the Maidan revolution changed uh, or redefined uh, Russian opposition? Do you think that it was a source of inspiration or perhaps something that could be extrapolated as a model in Russia? as was the conversation in 2014. And then related to that um, is, what's the big idea in Russia? If in Ukraine for Maidan protesters, it was EU in integration, rule of law. Does the Russian opposition have a similar big idea? Uh, so to start with, uh, with the second part of your question, of course, uh, the, the big idea is rule of law and inequality. I mean, Russia is, we, we run the whole 
2017 campaign on, on inequality and injustice. I mean, Russia is officially <coughs> the country with the high, highest Gini coefficient in the world, the relation between the income of 10% richest and, and, and poorest. Uh, so the level of injustice and inequality they, they come together is enormous and this uh, in people's perception is also something like very unfair uh, and I mean the Moscow dealership of Bentley is the best selling in the world and by official statistics I think 23 million people live uh, below poverty line that's uh, and that's what someone uh, like really sees every day that the only rating where Russia really managed to maintain a stable growth during all Putin's 18 years is, is the rating of the number of billionaires. And we actually now the second in the world after the US and the number of billionaires. So uh, this was always our main talking point and is our main idea and of course yeah, we have to, to fight corruption, to fight inequality, and it all comes together. And it's very easy to explain to, well, a regular voter in, in Smolensk what's wrong, because, I mean, uh, the salary of this voter would be around $300, or maybe even 250 And the only career path, the only dream would be to move to Moscow. And it's, of course, very disappointing. Uh, now, the events in Ukraine, the Maidan Revolution in 2014, made a very complex impact on the fate of Russia and Russia's Russian opposition. Uh, Putin used this to annex Crimea, which suddenly happened to be a very successful, I'm, I'm sorry to be a bit cynical, but happened to be a very successful move. Uh, for him, which boosted his approval rating enormously, he kind of felt this as a, as a political animal. He felt this would be a large success, and, and it was a large success. Well, then second, uh, Putin invested a lot in creating turbulence in Ukraine, uh, invad invading not only Crimea, but the Donbass region, uh, investing in, in any kind of uh, turbulence to have this as a as a counter example like you all know this buzzword you, you don't want it to be like in the Ukraine which is the main talking point of all the Kremlin propaganda over the last four years so of course I mean they put enormous efforts and doing the life in the Ukraine as complicated and as bad as possible to use this as an example for their propaganda. Uh, before that, quite successfully, so now after the 2018 uh, election, after the pension age reform, not anymore. So looks like people start to understand that you cannot put Crimea on the piece of bread and uh, put it in the fridge. Uh, still, I think that the fact that the uh, Ukrainian revolution was not that successful and didn't lead to like real change and increase in the uh, people's life level and so on, well, is is still important as, and essential. Is as a part of Russian opposition, of course, we I I wish. Ukraine also possible success to uh, for for Putin not to be able to use this Trump anymore. Could I follow up on that? Uh, have you had contacts with the Ukrainians who led the Maidan uh, and and thought about tactics in common? What works? What doesn't work? Or you? No, but I mean we 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 observe it. Of course we. Uh, we know a lot of what happened, what was good, what was bad, but we don't have any direct contacts. Good. I think there's a question down here. Oh, no. Uh, no, no. D uh. Down here. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Dominic. Um, you, you call yourselves the real opposition, but recently in Russia, um, 
the Zhirinovsky party has started winning these elections in uh, in kind of regional areas like Khabarovsk and um, I mean, how do you, yes. yeah, how do you interpret that? And um, how does Navalny, uh, can he channel uh, an opposition that might take a nationalist kind of direction? Or do you, you know, I'd just be interested in what your, your view is of that recent. Well, uh, yeah, look, uh, the relative success of uh, Zhirinovsky and the Communist Party in the recent regional elections only proves for the point that, well, that's why they don't let us participate in those elections. That even those uh, clones, those technical candidates who actually did everything they could do not to win, still won, won the election. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, in, in recent year, Russia has seen five, uh, Russia has uh, gone five times through the second round of a regional election, like when the uh, incumbent uh, didn't achieve 50% in the first round and there was a runoff. And in every of these cases, uh, the, in the incumbent lost in the, in the runoff in the second round uh, and lost dramatically. Like the 45 to 25 in the first round converted to 30 to 70 uh, in, in, in the second. Because when people see that there is, there is an opportunity to defeat United Russia, to defeat the ruling party, people turn out uh, to the polls and vote for whoever, doesn't matter, just for the fact that this guy doesn't belong to the ruling party. So this only uh, proves the size of the protest potential and why we have to demand uh, access to ballots, participation in the elections, and why we, we, we keep uh, demanding it. It doesn't prove any like nationalist stance or whatever. I mean, no one votes for uh, Zhirinovsky's candidates because Zhirinovsky is a nationalist uh, or, or something. He, he is nothing, he has no views on on, on, on politics, on, on political issues. The only reason people vote for his candidates is that they don't belong to the Putin's party. It's, it's a clear anti-Putin vote, and that's why it's important. Question right here. Hi, my name is Ivan. Uh, so I have a question about, like, uh, you absolutely right that when the official <coughs> telling that uh, it can be much worse if you choose somebody else, right? So, and people who lived in Yeltsin time uh, can compare how they lived before and how they live now. Like, I left uh, Russia when it was still Yeltsin in power, and then I come in back like every seven years, and every time I come back, I see life is better and better, and last time I was in August, it's even better than it was seven years ago, and people different like young generation smiling, talking about everything. Old generation, yes, yeah, some suffer, but some still have a small businesses and it's working. Yes, they complain for corruption. They complain that there are some issues, but it's basically uh, common complaints which can be everywhere. Uh, my question is about different thing. When I hear what opposition saying, most of them saying exactly the same how bad is in this time in Russia, how bad regime, how bad this, how bad, but none of them saying what is our way to make it better, just step by step, what we can do differently, what you can do differently from Communist Party, who still has like 13% of voters. And I check uh, what Navalny published in his uh, presidential election, half of this is make pension for everybody, make medical care for everybody, like American Sanders. And it's not different from what communists are saying because they also appealing to the same group who grows in the time of Soviet Union when everything was free. And yes, they so have what, already what's, what's the these questions? waters. Sorry. That's what I'm asking you. Uh, how you can make yourself different from communist for this part of people who will what? and how you can solve these problems if there is no money, industry in some cases is collapsed, and you just so come the in the office, what, you became a president, and what, what you can do, 
like not just declare we have a new uh, used, uh, judges, we have uh, what new laws, but how that will work because people still there and you have no team. Like, is anybody experienced in governing or if anybody can do something for industry and plan it? Because yeah, it's not so, we have, we yeah. have the question. So, thank you for the brief summary of the main talking points of the uh, of, of Kremlin. Uh, I mean, it's. So the life is good as it never had been, right. especially in Moscow. People are smiling in the streets. Right. You don't want to back to the 90s. You don't have a exactly. don't have have a team, and you saying just very common things about uh, like uh, making the salaries and pensions uh, higher, and that's all uh, Sandro style bullshit. So that's 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 important. That's a talking point we face. Every city we go, every crowd we talk to, that's, that's absolutely okay. I can't give a very short answer. Well, I have to address you to the presidential program, which is very detailed and addresses all these uh, uh, issues and still available on Navalny website. The most important thing is, first, there is money in the country. The country is enormously rich, and the corruption, <coughs> the level of corruption is what doesn't allow for uh, people to, well, live a decent life. Uh, the one number to give, the average kickback for a uh, contract for, say, road construction, uh, in a road construction procurement was around 5% in 2000 and is around 70%, 70 uh, percent percent now in 2018. So the uh, corruption burden, burden on the economy has grown like 15 fold in this last uh, 20 years. And if we just follow the very basic steps to reintroduce rule of law, like democracy, independent press, fair elections, and independent courts, we'll be able to, well, to fight largest part of this corruption, and this will immediately mm, make the country and its people much richer than now. I realize that it sounds like, once again, not, not rocket science. It sounds like very simple, but it, it, it hasn't been a different because it is actually very simple. So, uh, uh, I mean, the, the challenges that Russia faces now uh, of uh, re relaunching the economy and reinstituting rule of law are not different from the challenges many of the countries uh, faced after uh, an authoritarian regime came to an end. And a lot of countries from, I don't know, Spain or Indonesia or Chile uh, resolved these issues very successfully and over a short period of time. Okay. Can I to just uh, basically I'm following uh, the question because it's a protest movement, it's an opposition, but my question is you have a lot of local officers, local uh, bases, uh, are you, and you mentioned that you basically try to attract different movements, environmental movements, all kinds of movements. How about some, uh, again, I don't know anything about his party orientation, but there are some figures who are doing very positive uh, job on the ground. For example, Evgeny Roisman. He's very popular, and he was elected, and basically, I guess, he was the very positive image. So my question is, it's all Moscow, Petersburg, some other uh, cities for rallies, but how about uh, kind of um, attracting someone who really has uh, some experience in real kind of is that, uh, the next step which comes after protest movements? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. So first of all, uh, it is true that Russia, I mean, Russia is a huge country which produces, which still produces enormous amount of talent and also of, of political talent, of managerial talent. And we try to work with this talent and to, to embrace all of the independent politicians in the regions to include them into our movement. Roisman is a brilliant example. We were not very close like 10 years ago. Now he's a close 
the closest ally, and we do a lot of things together with him. Uh, so Milov is another example, uh, Yashin, of course, and, and some others. So it's, well, it's actually so not true to say that we don't have a team, because the, fact are, the facts are actually quite the contrary. We, <laughs> we have a brilliant team, uh, which consists of many uh, politicians and managers and uh, business people, and also, of course, uh, our own uh, staff that we visit, that we incubate and, and grow. I mean, every of our regional uh, heads of, of, of regional offices is a person who went through enormous pressure, enormous problems, and have proven uh, themselves to be a very well, effective manager, efficient manager. Uh, they built a political organization in, in their city, running almost on no resource, and, well, still organizing a lot of political pressure and so on. So the fact is that every of our regional office uh, coordinators would be a much better governor of the region than the, than, than the incumbent governor. Uh, also because it's hard to be worse. So thanks, uh, P Peter Rotland. Um, the, the apartheid regime in South Africa collapsed after part of the business elite and even part of the security police started negotiating with the opposition. So how op optimistic are you that there are business groups in Russia and even state officials in Russia who are willing to come over to your side? Yeah, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's an important question. So far, we haven't seen any direct movement from, from, in, from the existing parts of political elite or business elite towards us. Well, the risk to be poisoned is probably a bit too high. But, uh, I mean, we, we feel that there is a lot of, you know, whisper there and probably we don't have to wait too long before they try to reach out. But what's important, we measure uh, a lot of uh, protest mood among the police, for instance. Uh, so to give one example, so we published a large investigation about corruption uh, in the National Guard. And then we launched a poll uh, uh, among the police officers in a, in a, in a so, uh, social not network where uh, they, they have a group where like police officers are active asking like whom do you trust more the leadership of the National Guard or Navalny investigation about their corruption well 30 percent were supporting the leadership of the National Guard 70 percent were supporting us that's good but two months later when we launched like a second investigation, there was this well famous story with uh, Zolot of the head of National Guard uh, asking Navalny for a duel. And well, but long story short, after we uh, published the second part of investigation and gave more evidence, evidence, there was another poll in the same group, which resulted in a ten, ten to ninety. In, in our favor. So over a relatively short period of time, we kind of shifted, and, and the group has like 170,000 members, most of them uh, police officers. Uh, so we, sh we, we gained 20 points among this audience, uh, which is, well, which is quite impressive, I would say. Okay. Yes, um, Andrei Semyonov, Macmillan Center. Um, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is about coalition building. So no transition happens without effective coalition. And you started talking about that. So you have some powerful allies, etc. But do you have any particular strategy? Like what are the business groups that you would like to target? Or what are the political groups, interest groups, or more broad, so in, a bro in a broad societal sense? What are the groups that you would like to approach first to make the uh, formidable coalition against the regime? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I have a very quick answer. Uh, we, will be, we will be able to build a very efficient coalition when there is time to build a coalition. And this time is when it goes to a fair election and where is the reason to build a coalition. There is no need to like, unite 
for the, for the sake of unification. There is a reason to unite to achieve some goal. So recall the 2013 Moscow mayoral election. I was head of the, camp uh, the campaign office. I had like 200 people in my camp campaign office from the moderate nationalists to uh, LGBTQ activists who, well, under other circumstances would probably like try to beat each other, but they had a common goal, a very clear one, like to get Alexei elected or to get as, as many votes as possible. And this very naturally contributed to building of a coalition. And this will happen the next time. So we have here Daria, who is a li libertarian. No, no, no. And she was on 2013 uh, Moscow campaign staff. And uh, well, apparently we are quite far away ideologically from the Libertarian Party. But there is no doubt that, I mean, during the presidential campaign, a lot of uh, members of the Libertarian Party joined our regional offices and worked on our staff. And if there will be like a next election where we'll be admitted to the ballot, where there will be a chance, uh, of course, we'll, we'll work together. So there is no need to build the coalition intentionally. It will, it will be formed when there is enough reason for that. Yes, thank you. And maybe one short question. Um, if Navalny won, what would his cabinet look like? Do you have an idea what's the, what's the uh, prime minister, you know, and the rest of the stuff? Mm. Thank you. We wanted to publish, actually, the potential uh, cabinet uh, uh, if, he w if, if he would be admitted uh, in, uh, to run in 2018. Well, we, we had to. Uh, uh, now, I would prefer not to do this. Uh, well, also, also because it could be a little bit harm harmful to some of these people. But uh, the main principle would be, of course, meritocracy and competition. So we would run open contests for any position, as we did it on our uh, campaign trail. Like we, so we had 300 staff during the campaign, like three, four people in every of 80 uh, regional offices, and all these positions were filled through an open competition. We had like 6,000 CVs and people competed to get those positions. That's, that's the principle. Thank you, Mr. Volkov, for sharing your thoughts. Um, you said in response to another question that support for parties like Zhudinovskis and the Communist Party is actually evidence for support of opposition parties like your own. And if only Navalny was allowed to compete, um, people will vote for him, and that nobody is actually voting for clowns like Zhirinovsky. Well, the thing is that politicians described as clowns have been winning elections, and they've been <laughs> winning elections in countries that haven't been fed media diets of extreme nationalism for the last 10 or 20 years. So my question for you is why do you think that progressive liberal parties like your own, if suddenly we had free and fair elections in Russia, would win as against um, parties like Zhudinovsky's, which have an appealing narrative and have had media exposure? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a valid question. The answer is that uh, because we are better in campaigning. So before, I mean, before the Moscow, Moscow mayoral election, uh, the approval rating we were measuring so was about three points. But what, what, what's, what's important is the campaign, the outreach, the ability like, to work hard and to uh, spread your message to, to, to get to the people. And here, we are just stronger as a political organization because, well, Zhirinovsky has no like, ground stuff, no ability to, to, to reach out to people. So of course we will have to fight, but we are completely ready to that fight and I mean, Campaign is, is how votes are won. That's, that's an argument for uh, which, which Kremlin used a lot also. Why should we uh, admit Navalny to the presidential election if he is somewhere around two points in the polls? And it was true. The other part of the truth was, was they didn't know and they didn't want to check where we should go through a campaign through a massive outreach campaign within if 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 admitted and I think we will be able to beat Vrinovsky and the communists by a wide margin. I mean 
that's still my feeling. I dream of having a chance to prove it. Okay, how many more questions are there? Over here. So I'll try to keep my answers as short okay, as so possible. We're, we're going to work this side and then we're going to end with you. Okay. Yeah, we have to get ready in seven minutes, I think, because of the next Macmillan event. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, well, why don't we do two questions at a time? So here and then back. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Roman Bogarikov. I am a mathematics teacher here in the US and a former head of the unit for European Union and Russia uh, cross-border cooperation back in Moscow in the Federal Ministry of Economy. Uh, I want to concentrate actually on one point. How would you ensure if any of those three th scenarios takes place, how would you ensure that actually failed action will be held in Russia? Well, there is no warranty, of course. That's, that's something we'll have to demand and something we'll have to fight for. But there are good, uh, well, there is a fair chance that we'll be able to achieve it because, well, we have a trained army of election, election observers. We have a lot of experience. We, we know how the elections are rigged and what's wrong with the current elections. So uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm not holding it for, uh, for granted, but it's a very feasible uh, goal. Okay. Uh, Thanks very much question. for your talk. Um, I'm more interested in the foreign policy bit of um, Navalny government. If he were elected, how are you going to deal with countries like China these days, the war in Syria? How are you going to deal with it? Or are you going to end it directly? How are you going to deal with America? And also, what kind of countries will be your allies? Yeah, Vincent, thank you, but <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I'll not be able to cover this in the remaining several minutes. So it's a, a sudden switch from, from internal politics to, uh, to, to foreign politics. Uh, what we have heard among our supporters during all the year and a half of campaigning is that the key to Russian foreign policy is in its internal policy. That's a demand of our supporters that we have to stop investing in Syria and Ukraine and uh, Central African Republic, whatever, whatever, but we have to start investing in Chelyabinsk, Omsk, uh, hospitals in Voronezh and road quality in, in, in Vladivostok. That's, that's, that's a very important popular demand. The, 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 our voters, our supporters don't want Russia to like mimic the superpower and to play the scenarios of, of, of the Cold War to be that active uh, on the international scene as Putin tries to be. And actually, I think, I believe it's, it's a good strategy. Do you return Crimea to Ukraine? Uh, the, the fair answer is that they, it's not possible and that the Crimea will remain a major problem of international politics for at least next 50 years. I have a question over here. Hello, my name is Jessica Ramsey, and I'm a senior at Glastonbury High School, and I'm studying Russian politics and demographics. So my question is, what does Navalny suggest to do about the readily declining population, and in particular, low birth rates in Russia? Mm. Well, the truth is, it's not rapidly declining, and the birth rates are not very low. They are, they are comparable with the average European. So the demographic situation in Hungary or in Finland or in many countries are uh, much worse uh, than in Russia. Uh, but, well, the, the basic answer is that if we uh, see the economic growth, we will see also the, the, the demographic situation is better. So now, if you consider, well, a young couple uh, in a small regional city to uh, get a baby as a adventure which requires a lot of bravery. Uh, the, the situation has to, uh, has to change. Okay, there was one more question I found over here and I think we can take it. Sure. Uh, wait for the, the microphone, please. It should be switched on, yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, the uh, judicial reform as a number two point. Yes. Uh, the current one is pretty much spoiled. How, where are you going to find so many qualified lawyers, prosecutors, and so on? And the second part is how are you going to make sure that like, uh, the Stalin-style prosecution doesn't repeat itself in Russia? 
well, it's, it doesn't repeat if you don't repeat it. Uh, this, this, the first question is more important. Uh, well, I would love Michael to be here. We have a fantastic fellow on our group of uh, world fellows, Michael Kalisa from Rwanda. And they went through all of this after the genocide when they had like only 12 judges left for the whole country. Like all others were just killed. And they managed to rebuild it quite fast. You can record also on competitive uh, ground, so on, based on meritocracy, from, from lawyers, from uh, all kinds of lawyers, you can record new judges. And uh, the, actually, they will be better judges than the, the current one, the, the, the corrupt ones. It will be, of course, a challenge, but it's a challenge other countries had successfully overcome and we could do it as well. I think we've exhausted all the questions. I'm, I'm sure we haven't, but thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> thank <anyway>. you. <laughs> Well done. Great yeah. job. Thank you so much.